This is Power Trading Radio. Live. Power Trading Radio. Live. Fueled by Online Trading Academy. For more information on the show, visit us online at powertradingradio.com. Now, here's your host, Merlin Rothfeld. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Power Trading Radio. This is John O'Donnell. As you can see, Merlin's not here today. He's taken off. He took off this week in anticipation of a little early holidays vacation for a little R&R, some well-deserved R&R, I might add. But we're going to have a great guest on today. We've had him on Power Trading Radio several times. He's always been very, very popular with our audience. And we're going to talk to Dr. Mark Thornton of the Mises Institute. And as many of you very well may recall, in, w in one of our interviews, we discussed his new book, The Skyscraper Curse. So, Mark, welcome back to our show. John O'Donnell, it's great to be back on Power Trading Radio. Well, happy holidays to all of you and your family down there in uh, wonderful Auburn, Alabama at the Mises Institute. I'm sure you're all going to have a wonderful holiday. Oh, yes, we're planning on it. It's been a great year for the Institute. And uh, we're hoping for a great 2020, and uh, tonight is our Christmas party, so we're in a very celebratory mood. Very good. Jeff, you probably can't see it. You're probably not in front of a computer, but for those that are watching our, our video series on uh, YouTube, uh, which is broadcast streaming over powertradingradio.com, I have a, an image up of a large uh, iceberg. And if I can read this, if you look at the waterline of this iceberg, about 5% of the mass of the iceberg is tipping above the waterline. It's very visible to anybody approaching the iceberg. But below the iceberg is this convoluted mass of ice, very, very large, probably large as one of your skyscrapers, underneath the waterline that nobody can see. Uh, and that's where the dangers lie. And my theme of this show today is that there's a lot of unknowns, what we call VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity in the world today that's going to impact the capital markets in the new year. And I felt it was imperative that we revisit and get an update from you on uh, the state of the skyscraper curse, because I believe the theory behind the skyscraper curse is part of this iceberg under the waterline that very, very few people can detect. And so how about giving us an update? First of all, maybe refresh our audience's memory. What is the skyscraper curse? And what is the state of its development from your perspective? Well, the skyscraper indicator is the unusual correlation of the building of the world's tallest skyscraper, a new world record, and a world economic crisis. And this coincidence dates back into the 19th century and uh, it has a remarkable record and basically what happens is that in inflationary times of easy credit and low interest rates uh, people start building really tall buildings and eventually somebody sets a new world's record and then shortly thereafter there's an economic crisis and that's the skyscraper curse part of the whole thing and uh, it, it does have a remarkable record. And the reason I think it has that record is because underneath, as you suggest, what's really going on is that these low interest rates are encouraging entrepreneurs, they're faking entrepreneurs out about the real state of the economy and people undertake very long range projects like building skyscrapers, developing new drugs, all sorts of things like that that are going to only pay off 20, 30, 50 years uh, into the future. And then, of course, reality starts to uh, reemerge. Uh, prices and costs and profits all s start to change. And that's what inevitably causes the economic crisis or the skyscraper curse part of it. Uh, and, it and this time is really no different uh, they started a building in Saudi Arabia It's going to be a kilometer tall, and it's been delayed, but the original projection of its breaking the record was 2020. So, um, 
you know, the events in the real world are, are starting to line up in that direction. We've seen an enormous amount of uh, construction spending and, and uh, investment uh, and in these very long-term structures that are really meant to last basically for, uh, for the foreseeable future. And, uh, and so it's, uh, it's something that we should be cautious about because of the fact that the skyscraper curse has, a, has such a great, a great record of uh, being able to predict these momentous changes like the Great Depression, the Panic of 1907, the stagflation of the 1970s, the tech bubble, and, and the list goes on, including the housing bubble. I was able to predict the, almost the precise timing of the housing bubble yeah. with the uh, lining up with the Burj Khalafi Tower in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, that's very interesting because I had the opportunity to, we have an office uh, in Dubai, and I had the office, had the opportunity to go up in that tower. I didn't go all the way to the top. It wasn't complete at that point uh, because I believe I took my tour in April the, or the spring of 2005, but uh, it was a very, very impressive uh, situation. Uh, what's grounded in your uh, theory of the skyscraper curse is related to Mises' Austrian business cycle theory, isn't that correct? Uh, yes, massive government intervention into the capital markets? That's absolutely correct. Uh, that knowing Austrian business cycle theory, which started out under Ludwig von Mises and then his student F.A. Hayek, um, they showed what's really going on beneath the, the, the surface with distorted interest rates and uh, what happens is, of course, if you reduce interest rates, you change uh, the present value calculation of investments so that these long-term investments seem to be more profitable. And it doesn't have to be just skyscrapers. Another good example is uh, prescription product uh, development. It's something that takes a very long time, an enormous cost, and the revenues don't start to roll in for 10 or 15 or 20 years. And so the skyscraper is just a convenient uh, tool to illustrate uh, the Austrian business cycle theory and what's really going on throughout the economy, whether you're in Dubai or whether you're in China or whether you're in Auburn, Alabama. You can see these manifestations if you understand Austrian business cycle theory and the impact of artificially low interest rates on the economy. Well, in spirit of the iceberg uh, metaphor, uh, Merle and I have made up a list of 20 potential risks uh, to the capital markets going forward in, in 2020, not in any particular uh, order uh, of importance or probability. It's just uh, he and I sitting down with a piece of paper and writing some things down top of mind that we felt uh, would be a factor in this a component of the iceberg that's under the waterline that nobody uh, really has their finger on the pulse. But when you look at a list of these, uh, which we have on the screen for our, our video uh, users, um, let me go through these and, and get your response on, on some of these. Uh, in no particular order, and, and you may agree with some of these, you may disagree with them, but I'd like you to just give me your off of the top uh, of the head uh, opinion on, on some of these as a probability of, of perhaps being any one or any combination of what I'm about to work to go through could be a trigger for the next recession. Uh, at least it, that's the way Merlin and I feel. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Uh, the first one let's talk about is the uh, phase one trade deal remains unsigned. Uh, uh, it's continued uncertainty about what comes after phase one. Well, uh, I'm pretty convinced that uh, there is going to be a deal that gets done. I think it's in President Trump's interest to get it done before the election. I think the Chinese uh, would very much like to get it done. Uh, they're very much struggling with you know, the higher cost involved and, and reduced exports, uh, economic pressures on their economy. So I think it's in both sides' interest uh, to get something done probably around the time 
uh, of the Democratic presidential convention. Okay. Uh, so, this one is, is a bit controversial, but we threw it on the list anyway. Uh, continued increase in wealth inequality, income inequality, and health care inequality. Well, you know, those are all big problems. I'm working on the, the issue of income and wealth inequality uh, right now, uh, hopefully for a future book. And the big problem there is that we have 89 welfare programs, and the bottom 40% of our population receives, you know, an enormous amount of income or purchasing power from those programs, and the top 40% uh, really are, the, are paying all the taxes. And so if you take into account all the welfare that's going out and all the taxes that are being paid, we have a very progressive income uh, tax. Uh, the statistics that are often cited in the media uh, are outrageous compared to the reality of after tax, after welfare income. So it, politically, that could be uh, a bad trigger, uh, but in reality, it's not as bad as the media is pointing it out. Okay. Um, trade war and regime uncertainty continues to weigh on corporate CapEx decisions. Oh, yeah, I think that's, that's a big problem. Um, the problem in Chile and, of course, the rest of South America, uh, that's a big problem. And uh, with Hong Kong and China, uh, that's also a big problem. It, it, th these are areas where there's a lot of international trade between the U.S., South America, and China. And uh, that's impacting capital expenditures, and it could get much worse. And so there's, you know, there's a lot of opportunity that entrepreneurs see in investing in South America, China, the U.S., uh, but these, these kind of disturbances and potential trade wars uh, could very much undermine the economy because it's dependent upon continued investment. Number four, ongoing slow growth in Europe and Asia triggering significant U.S. dollar appreciation. I'm not so much worried about dollar appreciation. I think that to the extent that that happened, uh, it's already happened. It's already been keeping the dollar value uh, pretty high. And so uh, I don't see really any continued uh, problems in, uh, in growth over in Europe and Asia uh, to have an upward thrust in the value of the U.S. dollar. Okay. Number five, impeachment uncertainty and possible government shutdown. Well, as far as the impeachment is concerned, I don't see any interest by the American people uh, in this impeachment. Uh, I haven't talked to anybody really about it. Uh, I don't really see any substance behind it, and I, I think it, the House is going to vote for it. The Senate's going to kill it. I'd like to see the Senate uh, lay out the facts. Uh, but I'm, I think they're going to go for a short uh, session, and, and it'll all be over with. This may very well uh, make uh, President Trump look better in the eyes of 50 percent of the uh, voters plus one. Well, that brings us to number six about the U.S. election. Uncertainty, implications for taxes, regulation, and CapEx spending. Well, right now, I, I, as I mentioned, I think uh, President Trump is in a pretty good position. Um, uh, I would say that if the election started swinging towards Senator Warren or Senator Sanders uh, in the Democrats, I think that there would be a, a lot of concern um, in capital markets and by entrepreneurs from the biggest investment firms in New York City down to uh, the local uh, businesses on Main Street. Number seven. Because, because, of, because of the implications of... Uh, higher taxes and uh, redistribution. Yes, and the heavy hand of government in regulation uh, is, is, I think, is a very big, uh, uh, you know, uncertainty builder as well for business. Number seven, antitrust, privacy, and tech regulation. Well, I wouldn't think that there was going to be a problem there. It, a lot of that depends on the election and the regulation aspect also depends on the election. President Trump's administration has greatly 
deregulated, and that's created a lot of jobs. If that was to be reversed, it could be a, a very negative thing for the uh, for the market. All right. Um, number eight: Foreigners lose appetite for U.S. credit and U.S. Treasuries following the presidential election. Well, that's a very good question. Um, there, um, a lot of that depends on the country, uh, and I think that if we see interest rates rise and uh, the value of U.S. governments fall, uh, it wouldn't take very much of a fall to put them underwater on their investments, and you could see a, a big movement out, and, and those higher interest rates could be uh, devastating for stock market values. Well, that gets us to our that uh, gets us to our next point. U.S. government debt levels begin to matter for long rates. I think that is going to be the case. Um, I think you know the amount of borrowing has been enormous, and the world has been absorbing an enormous amount uh, of debt. And I think that that is something that could easily turn, and a slight turn could turn into a large turn, and that again would be very bad for uh, stock market values. Number 11, a mismatch between supply and demand in T-bills causing another repo rate spike. Well, yeah, that was uh, came out of the blue, so to speak, um, that, uh, you know, investment banks w were spread so thin um, and the, the uh, market makers in New York uh, were spread so thin that they couldn't take even a small uh, adjustment. So that is a lot bigger problem uh, than most people are aware of, uh, and it indicates a lot of uncertainty, the fact that the Fed had to come in with a fire hose of, of new credit to, uh, to, to seal the door on that, on that particular problem. So that, that potentially is going to be involved with um, uh, a big credit risk to the market. Um, number 12 is the Fed, the possible Fed reluctance to cut rates in an election year. Well, I think that they'd rather uh, not cut and probably not raise rates. Uh, the, the issue is what are markets going to do? The Fed does not have complete control over these interest rates, uh, only in the very short run. And, you know, in their, their ability to control the short run uh, has a big impact on the long run. And so uh, politically and economically, I think they'd rather disappear and not have any uh, policy moves uh, in the coming year, which is traditional with the Fed, that they don't want to get caught up in the politics of mm -hmm. election years. Well, the next few that we're going to take a quick look at, uh, Mark, is particularly related to the vulnerability in the credit market. Um, so the first one we're going to look at is credit conditions tighten with more differentiation between the CCC and BBB corporate credit sectors. Well, yeah, that's, that's, that's a big problem because right now, and I think this is going to continue, uh, that earnings are going to decline and, and miss their targets. Uh, revenues are going to uh, not decline but not grow as anticipated and miss their targets. And I think costs are really starting to, uh, to kick into gear. You know, commodity prices are have been at extremely low levels for a very long time. I see that turning around, and I see that negatively impacting uh, the results of corporate America, and that's, that's going to look real bad. Number 14, credit conditions tighten with more differentiation between CCC and BBB consumer credit. Well, you know, right now there's uh, very low unemployment, uh, there's lots of jobs available. Uh, there's um, increasing wage rates relative to the past. And so right now, the consumer is in a pretty good position. You're going to have to see uh, changes in the labor market and wages uh, for consumer credit, even though there's a lot of it out there, uh, for that to turn lower. So we want to keep an eye on uh, labor markets and wage growth there to see uh, changes there would, which would ultimately impact uh, ratings in consumer debt. The next one is 
continued disruption in the retail space because of the likes of digital technology order entry and delivery and continued closing of retail storefronts at an accelerated pace. Yeah, I think the uh, Main Street brick and mortar companies are, are clearly in trouble. Uh, that's going to continue. And one of the things about this, John, is that the ultra low interest rates are really helping uh, companies like Amazon build out their infrastructure to stay ahead of the brick and mortar operation. So it, as long as interest rates remain ridiculously low, that gives a big advantage to online platforms. They, they have the money, they have the credit to build out their infrastructure. Amazon is investing an enormous amount of money uh, under those conditions, and they're winning. And, and so that is a threat. Uh, it's part of a natural evolution, but it's a natural evolution that is um, on the fast track because of Fed low interest rates. And there's another one is about corporate credit of the fallen angels. More companies falling into BBB and out of BBB category into the high yield category, junk category. Oh, yeah, I'm definitely worried about the junk bond market. Uh, as more of those companies get downgraded, into junk status, uh, it's going to have an overall negative adverse effect on the junk bond market. There's only so much demand uh, for that kind of stuff. And yes, people will buy more if the rates are higher, uh, but if there's a tremendous increase in supply, it's going to swamp that market. and It's going to really uh, hurt that market in particular. And of course, that's uh, something that impacts expectations in all other credit markets when they see problems uh, in the junk bond market. More European and Japan negative yielding sovereign debt since glo sends global investors on renewed hunt for yield in the U.S. credit market. Well, I, you know, that certainly can happen. Um, the uh, European Central Bank and the Bank of Japan have been keeping zombie corporations and zombie uh, government debt afloat for a very long time in decades in the case of uh, in the case of Japan in many years in the case of Europe and of course the pigs uh, Portugal uh, uh, Italy Greece and Spain are still problematic uh, companies even though their countries even though their uh, companies have been uh, you know, subsidized, and their government debt is, of course, obviously greatly subsidized. You know, when Italy can borrow for just a couple of percent, the the Italian government can, and other governments can borrow at you know ridiculously low, low rates. Uh, it's covering up a huge problem, and uh, that problem could be revealed uh, as it was a decade ago. Okay. Um. Declining in a trend of declining corporate profits, it's going to make available fewer dollars available for stock buybacks and mergers and acquisitions. Yes, that's that's true. Uh, mergers and acquisitions uh, come in waves, and they come in waves uh, at very high levels when interest rates are artificially low. And if some of these other problems uh, end up raising interest rates and making credit uh, more costly, then the merger movement will will just go away, basically. And you'll, So that's a leading edge that we need to keep our eyes on when companies um, that, uh, you know, pull their stock uh, sales, uh, stop the buybacks, um, you know, when you see those uh, initial public offerings failing uh, that's a leading edge of trouble to come. So that's something we definitely want to keep our eye on in 2020. Shrinking global automobile industry is at risk for global markets and the economy. Yeah, you know, I think the the auto truck uh, market is uh, bloated. Uh, the, the, the vehicles themselves are bloated. Uh, the companies are bloated. Their inventories are starting to bloat as well. And uh, I don't know about you, but when I watch television, local TV, you see nothing but ads for pickups and automobiles, yep. 
uh, with no money down, seven years, zero interest uh, free uh, loans and things like that, that's really a sign of overcapacity uh, in place. And, uh, you know, and the con- American consumers and probably in other countries as well have a large amount of uh, not just student debt and, and credit card debt, but they have a lot of auto debt. You know, when people are buying fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollar cars and trucks um, on, you know, subpar incomes, that's that's a sign of to be uh, to be looked after very carefully. And I think the fact that I see so much discounting in in all the various ways in which those companies discount their vehicles. Um, I really wonder what's going on in terms of their inventories and their their uh, expectations for revenues going forward. Yeah, and especially for that category of truck that's used in the construction trade, um, those trucks might have, they, they take a lot of wear and tear. They might have a five-year life, but they got seven-year financing terms. <laughs> yeah, that's a big problem. Real and, problem. You know, the um, now the automobiles that they're building uh, do tend to last uh, longer, and that's one of the rationales they've given for extending, uh, which was you know two-year loans when I was a boy, and it's gradually increased in every uh, big bubble. They they extend it out now it's seven years yep. that they're lending money for with with, with a lower credit rating. <laughs> yes, with a lower credit rating, they're yep. they're also advertising that um, you know the, we're, we're not looking at your credit or you know low scores are okay and, and things of that nature uh, and th- you know they've got low scores at a time when jobs are plentiful uh, you know that's that's not a good combination yeah you got it number 19 we're almost there mark uh, this is uh, this is a bit out there but when you really think about it it certainly could be a trigger for multiple of these that we've discussed earlier House prices crash in Australia, Canada, and Sweden. Um, well, uh, house prices crashed in Australia uh, the last time around. They did not in Canada, and and so that market continued ever higher. Very surprisingly, that they were able to avoid that. But housing prices are also high in Sweden and Norway and a lot of other places. They've really uh, gone up there, and of course here in the U.S., uh, prices. I think they're uh, the price Schiller index is back up to uh, housing bubble levels. Yes, so, and and the, of course people are building uh, bigger homes and more uh, tech installed type homes. Um, you know, which is great and it's fun and all that, but it's uh, when everybody's doing it, it's a problem. Yeah. This is our last one. It's certainly last but not least. It's Brexit uncertainties still persist, and we really don't know how this is going to play out, will we? I mean, the first year of them getting out of the EU uh, is certainly going to be a transition period for trade. That's absolutely right, and I think that Brexit is less of a problem than a lot of people uh, think, and it's something that markets and companies have been making adjustments. They've been studying the situation. Um, if it's done correctly, I don't see why it would be a problem if uh, the U.K. Uh, marches out a complete free trade policy with everybody. Uh, I think that would be a, a good thing. I would think it would uh, send um, the European government um, and its supporters uh, uh, a message that centralization is not necessarily the way to go Mm -hmm. you know that we want separation we want free markets and interchange uh, but we don't want this just a a centralized government that's become massive and so that could be one of the better things going forward and I think that even if they muck it up which governments tend to do um, I think entrepreneurs investors and companies have had uh, enough time to make those adjustments, to make those calculations, and to study potential impacts. So the delay may have actually um, helped things out a little bit in that sense. Well, today we've been talking with Dr. Mark Thornton. I have an image of his book up. TJ, let's put this book up, The Skyscraper Curse and How Austrian Economists 
predicted every major economic crisis of the, of the last century. Uh, it's obviously available on uh, Amazon, uh, Mark, but do you have another location you'd like to send our readers to get a, a wonderful copy of this book and make an ideal stocking stuffer this holiday? Yes, I mean, you can order it from the Mises Institute, uh, M-I-S-E-S dot O-R-G. Uh, you can Google the skyscraper curse in my name, Mark Thornton, and PDF, and you'll be taken to a page where you can download an electronic copy for free. It's also available in Spanish for free. It's also available in an audio file for free. So everybody should at least take the opportunity to go get that electronic version and take a look through some of the chapters to see if the book's for you. I think it uh, is not just a good warning about uh, Federal Reserve artificial interest rate policies, but it teaches a lot of economics and Austrian economics uh, in a way that's palatable. Uh, one thing uh, that's in there, John, is I talk about roundabout production techniques, which is never really explained in the Austrian literature very well. But what I did is I provided an illustration of the dairy industry, what it was like when I was born, and what it's like right now. I remember that uh, chapter. Yeah, it, it's, it, it gives you some sense of what's really involved in roundabout production techniques. Well, that industry certainly been impacted by government intervention as well, hasn't it? Our oh, yeah. guest today has been Dr. Mark Thornton. Mark, thank you very much. I don't want to hold you up from your your holiday party there at the Mises Institute, but please give my love to everybody uh, there, and uh, let's do this again in the new year. Absolutely, John. Uh, Merry Christmas to everybody there at Power Trading Radio. Uh, happy holidays, and we'll do it again real soon. All right. Thank you. Good night. Ladies and gentlemen, I encourage you to think very carefully about this metaphor of the iceberg. There are dangers, opportunities that are in the iceberg. Most of those are below the waterline. To the naked eye and the untrained eye, they're not very visible. What mostly you and I see is that little tip of the iceberg sticking above the waterline. And from that, we make various assumptions about how to manage risk protect our capital, grow our capital in the years ahead. Uh, Merlin and I here at Power Trading Radio focus on bringing you timely information, thoughtful, purposeful information to help you make more informed choices in the managing of your resources. I've enjoyed being with you today. Tomorrow, we're going to have another Austrian economist on the show. This is like economics weeks. We're going to have Dr. Richard Ebling. He's one of the deans of the Austrian School of Economics. We're going to talk about free enterprise. And uh, he is a professor of economics at the Citadel University and uh, has a couple of new books out, uh, which we'll highlight. But you have a good evening. Enjoy yourself. I'll see you tomorrow. Peace. I'm out of here.